feel free to interrupt with any questions as we're going along. So today we're going to focus on multi multi-photon microscopy and how it's utilized for deep tissue and intravital imaging. Um, the overview of the talk is going to be as follows. We're going to talk about understanding fluorescence, so we're all on the same page with that, and then understanding the differences between epifluorescence, confocal microscopy, and multi-photon microscopy, and the limitations of each of those techniques. And then finally, we're going to end with examples of using the multi-photon in deep tissue intravital imaging. And a lot of those images were provided by your colleagues. So you'll get to see some of their stuff too. So let's start with the basics, understanding fluorescent microscopy. So what you'll see up here is the visible spectrum of light, right? We start out at around 400, 350, and we go all the way up into the infrared. Right? We're gonna talk about the speed of light being constant. It's dependent on the wavelength and the frequency of the light being produced. And just so we know, energy is roughly equivalent to frequency. So when we're looking at something like 405, which is over here in the UV range, this has high energy, high frequency, short wavelengths. Longer wavelength light, such as 700 nanometer light, is lower energy, okay? less photo damaging, less phototoxicity. And this is just a summary of that. At low wavelengths, high energy, high phototoxicity, High photo damage, this is why you get sunburn, it's the UV rays, and not the infrared rays. So when we're looking at fluorophores, the way fluorescence actually works on something like GFP or an Alexa dye is you have an incident, an incident photon exciting your electron, it moves up to an excited state, right? and then on the way down, you lose a little bit of energy and you get emission in a longer wavelength, i.e less energy, okay? right? So the emission wavelength is always gonna be longer than the excitation wavelength. And this is gonna be lower energy than the incident photon, okay? All of that gets summarized in these lovely little Jablonski diagrams where you have excitation at one wavelength, a little bit of energy is lost and emission at another. Right. I also wanna point out that excitation and emission isn't just one wavelength, it's actually a spectrum. So this is the excitation, I forget, I think it's for Alexa 48. And you can see that you can excite it down at around 325 nanometers, and then again at around 48, 500. All right. And the percent efficiency is gonna vary on what wavelength you're using. And then it's gonna emit, and it's not gonna emit just at one, and at one wavelength, you're gonna see a spectrum, right? And you can pull these spectrums up. There are lots of websites you're gonna see at the end of this presentation. There's two I'm gonna list. Thermo Fisher has one and that's where I put these diagrams. So you can look up the excitation emission spectrum of your fluid. Okay, so hopefully everyone understands fluorescence at this point. Now we're gonna talk about the microscopy techniques most of you have probably used. So the first one is epifluorescence microscopy. These are everywhere on campus. If you don't have one in your lab, your neighboring lab probably does. That's because they're really cheap to use. They're very simple scopes. So you start out with a lamp. This lamp usually emits white light, right? You don't want white light hitting your sample. If you're trying to do fluorescence, you're trying to excite at a super, certain wavelength. So you put an excitation filter in here. Now I'm exciting with blue light. Fluorophores in this cell are getting excited, right? They're gonna start emitting red. Right? That's going to go back up and it's going to go nowhere unless I put a dichroic mirror into the light path. And this blocks the excitation light and allows, I'm sorry, blocks the emission light back and reflects it off. So you can see it either with your eye or with your camera. Really simplified way of looking at a microscope, but that's how it's working. Okay. This works great when all of your fluorophores are in a flat single plane. All right, so I've got four, four, four fluorophores here. They're close to the cover slip. They're beautifully aligned. I'm gonna excite it with the blue light and I'm gonna look in this focal plane and I'm gonna get these nice little four spots are nice, sharp, clean and crisp. Right? But most biological samples do not behave like this. You often have stuff outside of that focal plane. Right? Here it's a little bit north of that. And you can see that if I go to focus on these, I'm going to get light from this out of focus fluorophore and you're going to get this 
haze that's coming from it, right? Usually it's not just one fluorophore in a biological sample. There's a lot of other fluorophores and you get this in your final image. And as a result, your epifluorescent images look something like this. And this is fine for a lot of purposes. I wanna see if my cells are expressing GFP. I wanna see where it's being labeled. You can look at this image and you can say, all right, the green fluorophore is near the plasma membrane. The red is somewhere inside. I can't tell if that's nuclear. It doesn't matter. It's, it's good. I can, if I'm trying to translocate, if I'm trying to look at translocation, I can probably figure this out, even with this really poor optical scope. Okay, so that's epifluorescence. It's, it's easy. It's fast. It's wonderful for imaging thin sections where everything's in the same focal plane, but it's really suboptimal when you start dealing with thicker samples. Okay, so you want to image thicker samples. And at this point, most people come and find me in the facility and they say, I want to do confocal. All right. So epifluorescence, another way of representing this is I have my objective focus on this plane right here, going through this object in this thick sample. The light's going through the objective, everything, the entire microscope, and it's in focus when it hits the detector. The light from this plane, it's coming through. It's also hitting the detector, but it's not focused, right? This is where that blur is coming from. That's also true of this. When I look down at the sample, what I'm going to see is I'm getting a really fat optical section. This is going to be in focus. The light from these two fluorophores is going to be blurred. Right? So confocal microscopy is born because you don't want this. You want something better. And what we do is we put a disc with a hole in it into the light path. This is what confocal microscopy is. The light from this plane hits this disc, it doesn't make its way through. The light from this plane hits this disc, it doesn't make its way through. Only the light from this plane, a little bit above and below it, is making its way through to the microscope or to the camera. And when I look down on this, I get a really thin optical section. It's really crisp, it's really clear. That's assuming you've set everything properly and we're paying attention and training. So, Confocal microscopy is great because then you wind up with an image that looks like this, right? So now we can clearly see, yes, the green was on the plasma membrane. The red is not nuclear, it's perinuclear. Okay, so that's the power of confocal microscopy. Most of the scanners in the facility are point scanning confocals. And what that means is since light is only coming through this one little spot, I am using a single detector and I'm imaging my sample line by line, point by point, the way an inkjet printer works. That's how your image gets generated. The other way you can do confocal microscopy is spinning disc microscopy. This is faster. You've got a disc with all of these pinholes. The lights get scattered onto your sample, goes back through and hits the detector. I mean, you can see that in action here. So there's a disc, it starts spinning. It's gonna eventually generate your image and you can capture images really, really, really quickly. The optical sectioning isn't quite as good as it is in a point scanning confocal. More than likely, at some point, you guys have either used a point scanning or a spinning disc confocal in your careers, or will in the future if you're a trainee. And what you do is you scan through your sample plane by plane, and then you can build these brilliantly gorgeous videos that everybody shows in their presentation where you're seeing these 3D volumes and they're spinning around in space. And that's how they get them. Okay. So that's confocal microscopy. One thing I want to point out is when it comes to photo bleaching and photo damage, whether you're talking about a confocal image or a wide field image, the photo bleaching is the same. Because remember, we're illuminating everything in both cases. The pinhole is operating somewhere up here to cut the out of focus light. So your rate of photo damage is going to be the same. Now, in confocal, you're likely taking a Z-stack, right? You're doing those multiple planes. And what you're going to see is as I'm scanning this through, I'm actually going to probably have more photo damage because I'm not just taking one image anymore. I'm taking 30, 40, 50, depending on the thickness of my sample to get those 3D values, All right? And I can get some really gorgeous things, right? This is a spheroid. You can see all the cells on the surface. It looks kind of like a cup. Right. This is a cross section of that. All right. So we're cutting through this plane in X and Y. That's here. This is Z. All right. So I cut through here, flip it on its side. It's like a CT scan, and you can see the volume. 
right? And you can see now what this looks like on the surface. So if I'm cutting really low, it's great, but as I'm going deeper, I'm getting this hollow hole. So at a certain point, confocal fails, right? So it's great for optical sectioning. You get these beautiful 3D volumes, but it's slower than wide field microscopy. So if you're coming to me with a four micron section and you want to image at 10X, you don't need confocal. Uh, you can do more photo damage than you would in wide field if you start taking C stacks. And while you can image deeper and better than wide field microscopy, you still can't go very deep. And the limit tends to be in the tens of microns. It really depends on the properties of your tissue, which is fine for a lot of applications. But when you want to go deeper, especially with something like intravital imaging or organoid imaging, you need a different technique. And for that, you do have photon imaging. Okay. So you saw this 10 seconds ago. This is excitation using one photon. Two photon excitation. What you do is you double up. You use two photons of lower energy and longer wavelength to excite your fluorophore. The emission in both cases is going to be the same. It's all about getting that electron up to an excited state. Once it's up here, it doesn't matter how it got there, it's going down the same. So your emission curves, 1p versus 2p, are the same, your excitation can be really different. Why are we going to the trouble of doing all of this? Well, it has to do with what the excitation actually looks like. So when you're doing single photon excitation, right, this is a green laser, your sample's focal plane is right here. You're exciting everything in this white path, right? Above and below it. Two photon microscopy, this is a 2p beam. There's nothing getting excited above and below that. So I'm getting a lot less photo bleach. Everybody clear on how much better this might be for your sample? Right. The reason this happens, and I don't want to dwell on this too long, is because the light coming out of your object objective actually looks like this hourglass. And it's only right here in the center where the density of the photons is the strongest where you're getting the excitation. And that's why we only see excitation in this plane. I also want to point out that this light is still there, but it's in the far IR range, and you aren't seeing it. You're not getting photo damage, but your sample is still seeing heat and other things from this laser, right? So it is something to keep in mind that even though I'm only seeing excitation at this spot, my sample is still seeing laser from those other things. But this makes a big difference on the photo bleaching of your fluorophores in your sample. So confocal, multi, confocal and wide field looks something like this. With 2P, we're getting just an excitation. And in fact, if you look at this under a gel, this is actual data. You've got one bleach line as opposed to this deep bleach smear. The other advantage of using these longer wavelengths is you get less autofluorescence, right? Many of you guys have imaged on a microscope. You know that with the green fluorophores, you have a lot of background autofluorescence. That's not the case when you move into the red channel. Lastly, not even lastly, but the other huge advantage of using two photon excitation is red wavelengths penetrate better. The further you move along that spectrum, the deeper penetration you get, right? And that's because shorter wavelengths scatter. Now, inherently, you've seen this in nature every single day. This is why when you look at a sunset, it's red. And when you're looking at the sun at noon, it's blue, right? And if a seventh grader asks you why this is the case, you could tell them, oh, that's because the blue light scatters. The same thing's happening in your tissue. Blue light gets scattered because it's higher energy. At and it doesn't penetrate nearly as well as the far right. So when you compare, this is the same sample, the confocal with the multi-photon, you can see that now we're getting much better excitation and emit all the way through, and we're getting much better imaging. In fact, we're starting to image the back of this. This is 100 microns in to the sample. 
And you can see that with the confocal, I see absolutely nothing in the middle, but on the multi-photon, I can see all of these cells and I can see that there's probably some necrosis or something odd going in that area. This image is taken from an actual mouse that was alive when it was taken. You can put the objective and you can go all the way a millimeter and a half into the mouse, right? And image different layers of the brain using multi-photon microscopy. This isn't anything you'd be able to remotely do using a laser at full viewing. The other really nice feature multi-photon microscopy has is something called second harmonics. So once again, this image, two photons stacking up against each other, you get excitation, you lose a little bit of uh, energy, it comes back, back down. Second harmonics that doesn't happen. You get two photons exciting it, there's no heat loss, and then you get emission at exactly half the excitation rate. What does that mean? That means your emission wavelength changes based on your excitation. So here's an example where you're exciting in 800 nanometer light, it's coming out at 400. If I move this up to 1000, it's gonna come out at 500. And this is one of the ways on the microscope we check for second harmonics. We start tuning the laser and we look to see if your signal's moving from the green channel, from the blue channel to the green channel, possibly to the red, depending on the microscope. Why do you care about second harmonics? Well, highly, it comes from highly ordered crystalline structures. In theory, lots of biological things can exhibit SHG, DNA, microtubules, et cetera. In reality, in samples, on the microscope, it's really collagen one that exhibits the highest SHG that's readily visible. And this is wonderful when you're in a mouse and you're looking for markers. You can see the collagen in the dermis. You can see the collagen around the blood vessels. You can see them around organs. So as you're scrolling through and focusing, you, you know exactly where you are. And it's actually quite strong. This is an example of SHG in the skin. We've got autofluorescence on the right, unlabeled collagen in the middle, and you're merging those and you can see this is a completely unlabeled samples, lots of structures in this tissue. So SHG is really, really powerful. The other thing to know when you're thinking about doing two photon excitation is, okay, I'm gonna try this now. How do I know what to excite? If this is, maybe my excitation is 450, maybe I just double the wavelength, 900. There, there I go, that's where I'm gonna tune the laser to. That's not how it works at all. In fact, you have to tune the laser. So our Nikon multi-photon, for example, it's got one laser on it. And you can tune that between 700 and 1,000 nanometers. You have to know where to position that laser beam or else you're not gonna get good excitation. You've got three dyes here. I've got Alexa 48, I've got DS Red and Alexa 640, or 550. 568. I'm guessing and everybody's inclination is when they sit down to do this for the first time, I'm going to have to excite at a different wavelength for AF488 and a different wavelength for AF568. The 568, whatever I choose for this is going to excite both, right? Because this is how it works on the, on the confocal. And maybe I'm going to choose 500 times two, 1,000 for Alexa 488. And I'm going to choose, uh, I don't know, 1150 for the DS red. That's not actually how it's going to play out. So if you look at Alexa 4D itself, you can see its peak actually isn't at 1000. It's down near 750. If you're looking at Alexa 4D and 568, you can see that these excite really, really well at around 800 if I'm combining both of those fluorophores. But DS Red, that I expected to have the same excitation as 568, because that's how it works in single photon, can't get excited at all the same way 568 does. So the 2P 
spectrum, the fluorophores is really unique. And you can't just look at the one P spectrum and say, I'm, I'm set to go. And this happens a lot because people come to us with, I have a red fluorophore, it's, I'm not sure, it's something red. And I want to image that plus a GFP. All right. M cherry is a super popular red fluorescent filter. Lots of transgenic mouse models have M cherry in them. And if you look at M cherry, you can say, that's great. I'm going to excite at around 750, 800. I should be able to capture that. And it doesn't matter that my this MP cuts off at 1,000, 775, 750, I'm going to be good. And you're right, you're fine. Until you decide to combine that with GFP. Right? If you look at GFP, its peak is at 1,000, 950 actually. So if I'm trying to combine M cherry and GFP in a live animal model, I'm not going to be able to. However, if that red floor four was TD tomato, no problem. I can cite near 950 and I'll be able to capture both of them. So choosing your red floor fours is really, really important if you're trying to do intra vital imaging. So if you're planning on doing these experiments, please come talk to us. You can pull up these spectrums ahead of time before you order all your animals, do your crosses, and then you say, and now I'm ready to go, because you may not be able to do your imaging. So the emission is the same. So your 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 Alexa, so let me repeat the question, A, so the microphone captures it, and B, to make sure I understood it. So what you're saying is on the single photon, Alexa 4AD, for example, you excite with the 4AD, and you're fine. And then you get emissions somewhere in the 500s, and you capture that, and you're great. So on the 2P, and you're wondering, what, why is it so different on the 2P? So the, the energy it takes, I'm not a physicist, so I, like, this is a little bit beyond my way to explain. But my understanding is it's not just the fluorophore, it's the environment around it. So just like in single photon, you can tweak the proteins. That's how you get CFP and GFP and YFP and RFP. It changes the chromophore's behavior based on its local environment and its configuration. That is also sensitive to the excitation. It's, it is energy, but it's also the environment around it. <laughs> yes, actually, if we go back, good, good question. Okay, I see what you mean. So, where are we? Nope, no. Okay, when we looked at Alexa floors, Single photon excitation. There's actually another peak down here. A lot of fluorophores have secondary peaks down in this range that you never see. Right? So, but even still, this isn't twice what this is. The peak down here is near 270. So you double that, it's near 600. So it's still not to whatever the wavelength is. It's different. But oftentimes you get these double peaks. And this is likely reflective of the fact that a lot of fluorophores have two peaks, just ones more in the UB range and you don't see it. Any other questions? So with... When you're multiplexing in multi-photon imaging, it's really critical that you're choosing the right labels. I will say that we now have a system that has two tunable lasers. So you actually can theoretically excite M cherry at the same time you're exciting GFP, but that's a lot of heat on your animal, right? Because now you have two multi-photon lasers scanning simultaneously. And just so you guys have an idea of the levels of power we're talking about, when you're on a confocal microscope, you're like 50 milliwatts at the source, 100 milliwatts. Really strong lasers are in the two, 250 milliwatt range. The MP laser is four watts, right? So now if you have two of those, that's eight watts. It's, it's a massive amount of energy on your sample. 
And of course, you lose some in the light path in both cases. It's not the full blaze, but it's they're class four lasers. So you still have to be really cognizant. Even though you're not getting photo bleaching, you could be doing heat damage and other, and other potential damage to your tissue if you're cranking this up really high. Okay. So speaking of labeling, how do you actually get things labeled? Of course, the GFPs, transgenic animals, this is from Ray Yee's lab. Um, these are fluorescently labeled cells. They're endogenous, they're crying with mom, they're all happy, right? You may need to label structures. You're not probably gonna have a transgenic mouse that has three fluorophores and has everything you want. So you're probably gonna be using dyes at some point. Blood vessel dyes, there's a lot of them. The most popular is dextran and you conjugate a fluorophore to it. This is an example of a blue dextran. It's labeling the vessel brilliantly. If you do a cross section, you can see the whole vessel is filled with dye. The higher the molecular weight dextran you use, the better off you are because the dextran is gonna get cleaved as you're imaging. And over time, that's gonna be leaching into the periphery. The sugar, so and your buddy's pretty good at breaking down sugars. So another way you can image something like blood vessel is, is to do an antibody injection. Right. This is from Bill Muller's group. They use PCAM to label cell junctions inside blood vessels. This has been injected into the mouse. You can see every single junction on this has been enabled. And now you can look at the endothelial cell borders on this blood vessel. And everyone's like, that's great. I want to do that. But you need a lot of antibody, right? Because you're, you're not adding one microliter to this mouse. You're tail vein injecting, and it's going throughout the entire animal. So this can get really expensive really quickly. It's, it's beautiful when you're trying to do this. And if you're trying to measure, for example, as Bill is, I'm looking at how cells penetrate through the vessels and whether they're going paracellularly or transcellularly, you need these orders labeled, okay? The other thing you need to consider is the scope probably doesn't look like most of the scopes you've seen. It's an upright microscope. It's got a dipping objective. And what that means is your sample has to be surrounded in the dipping media, in this case, water. And these lenses have a really long working distance so you can image deep into the tissue. So for example, this lens has two millimeter working distance. I need a two millimeter column of water above my sample to image. We have another lens that does eight millimeters of working distance. That sounds lovely, except you have to figure out how to keep a centimeter of water intact around your animal while you're imaging. Right? The other thing that happens when you're imaging is your objective is moving up and down through your sample. So if your sample is not immobilized, it's gonna start sloshing around and moving as well, right? So you're going to have to keep it submerged and you're going to have to keep it immobilized, especially if you're doing time lapses and long courses. So with teeny, teeny, tiny organoids, this can get complicated. There are tricks, right? We sometimes wedge it between cover slips. Some people embed them into matrix gel, but there are, there are ways of doing this. But it's another layer that you need to consider. And now when you're putting a mouse under there, the layer of complexity mounts even more, right? because it's not just minimizing the sample when the objective is moving, your animal's alive, right? So you've got to take account into the breathing, the heart beating, it depends on where you're imaging on the animal. If you're imaging on the ear, you don't have to worry about the heart beating and the breathing. You can immobilize that pretty well, isolate it from the rest of the animal's movement. If you've injected your tumor on the back of the mouse and now you're trying to image it, that's gonna be a lot more complex because the animal's gonna be breathing as you're trying to image it. So you may have to modify your experiment where, based on what you're imaging. Maybe now you're going to uh, inject on the flank as opposed to on the back of the mouse. You have to keep your animal alive and warm, right? Heated stages need to be there. If you're going back, if it's not a terminal procedure, I'm doing something on day one, I'm on this, look at it on day two or day five, you need fiducials. You need to be able to find that same location. And if it is going back to the facility, you definitely want to keep that mouse happy and talk to the facility about where you can bring it because you can't go back to bury. So there's, there's consideration. All right. 
So at this point, we've talked about understanding fluorescence and the difference between epifluorescence, confocal, and multifocal microscopy. I hope you understand the differences between them and the uh, things you should be thinking about when you're planning a multi-photon experiment. Uh, at this point, we're going to move on and talk about the labs, some examples, brief examples, of labs here at Northwestern who have been using multi-photon microscopy in their infravital imaging because um, some of it is absolutely gorgeous, right? So the first example I'm going to talk about is Ray Yee. He images the stem cell compartment in the skin. He's interested in aging, um, among other things. He often images in the ear. And this is really nice because he doesn't have to worry about immobilizing the animal the same way you would if you're on the floor. He also does a lot of multiplexing. So when he's in the end, oh, let me show the image. You can see he's got fluorescently labeled cells and I don't know what's happening. Uh, Right, and the blood vessels are labeled with a marker, and he uses SHG, which you'll see in a second right there. That's the collagen in the skin. Get the connection. To find out where the dermis is, and he goes from there. So from an animal perspective, it's actually a really simple setup. But the fact that he uses SHG, usually two or three fluorophores, and he's going into the far red channel, means he can't use the Nikon scope. In fact, the Leica scope, which was purchased for his startup package, is be precisely because he does a lot of multiplexing, a lot of complex fluorophores combinations. Okay, another investigator here, who's actually in the audience, is Dan Bratt. And they are looking at uh, immune infiltration in the brain following thrombosis. This is more complex, because now you're in the brain. Right? You cannot take the objective, put it up against the skull of a mouse, and hope to image the brain. So what they have to do is surgeries to excise the bone, put a cranial window on it. They're going back over time. So they have these little legs off the window to help immobilize the mouse, but also to help orient so they can get back to the same place time after time. Right? You have to learn how to do these surgeries and make sure the mouse survives. Right? Like we wouldn't do that well with the hole drilled into our head and potential fluid leaking out, but they seem to make it through. Okay. And then what that lab does is they go through and they use laser ablation to induce like an area of ischemia. Right. So here's in the uh, in the intratumoral. This isn't a tumor, the tumor is GFP labeled. They ablate this vessel, they block blood flow, and then block blood flow, and then they follow that over time. Here's an example in the microvasculature. You can see they've blown up this blood vessel. They're seeing the immune cells come in, and they can go back the next day and look at the same area and see what's happening. So these figures don't do the complexity of the experiment justice. But it's it's huge undertaking, right? And it's really, really cool. Uh, lastly, there's Ankit Baroth group. They are looking at immune cells in the lung following ischemic injury as well. Now, their animal setup is the most complex of all because they're imaging in the lung. They cannot have the lung moving while they're imaging these time points. And your mouse is breathing. So what they've done is they've done a surgery to intubate the mouse. And now what they can do is we've coordinated with the instrument. The instrument sends the signals to the respirator, the lung uh, inflates, and then breathing pauses. We take an image, send a signal, it releases, and then the mouse breathes normal for the next couple of minutes. We do this over and over and over again. Right? So you need a surgery to get this done. It's a terminal procedure because right, we've cut a hole in the lungs, or in the rib cage. But you can get these awesome videos off that as well. All right, so these are monocytes. There's actually red cells in here as well, going through the lung. And this is over the course of 20 minutes. I don't think you guys saw any movement whatsoever. All right, it looks like a still. Right. So, Right, so considering this mouse has been alive for 20 minutes and we're imaging, I think, every four, 
there's almost no movement here. And that's right next to the home. So you can do some really amazing things. Uh, a couple of resources if you guys are interested. First of all, there's us. Come and talk to us. Um, there's the Spectra viewers. The first one, FP base, has some 2P spectrums on there. The second one is MP 2P spectrums alone. Uh, if you're interested in optics in, gener in general, Jennifer Waters does a micro course, talks about resolution and NA and what a concocal is. You can find her talks on YouTube. Felix is uh, part of Ankit Bharat's lab. He's in the Department of Thoracic Surgery. He's worked with a lot of labs to get, get their multi-photon imaging set up in animals. Uh, he's imaged through the brain, through the lung, through the spleen, kidneys, tumors, et cetera. So he has a lot of animal expertise and he's more than willing to help as well. I can help on the microscopy side. He can help you discuss on the animal side. Um, and then there's a couple basic articles here, and I'll share these slides at the end so you guys can have them. Uh, resources, if you want to know more, if you want to get more into the nitty gritty about SHG and fibrosis, SHG and uh, limitations, or two photon absorption of molecules, like why is that different? You can find some of that information here. And then lastly, I want to say thank you to all of you. I guess we ended quite early. Um, Thank you to the Cancer Center and the Dean's Office. They support us, very, as, as does the Office for Research. They support CAMP. We're always thankful for their support. As you guys know, we're an Icon Imaging Center. Um, they support us as well. The Barat, Brett, Duncan, Muller, and Yee Labs for sharing data for this talk. And then, of course, CAMP staff and our oversight committee. Uh, and if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them now. So... So there's a couple ways to troubleshoot it. Uh, when you start doing multi-photon microscopy, you're really kind of blind. Uh, the objective is uh, 25X, so you're very zoomed in. This is why SHG becomes really important because you have no idea. You focus on something through the eyepieces. It's epifluorescence, so it's this big blob of nothingness. And then you just kind of have to get used to going deeper into the tissue. Uh, it could be anything from your dye concentration was too low. The excitation spectrum where you were tuning to was suboptimal. Uh, if you want to try it again, I would say we should start simple. Go in with the blood vessel dye first to make sure we're able to image inside the vessel. And then maybe the next day or later on in the afternoon, inject the dye. And I don't know if you were injecting IP or tail vein or... So essentially tailing. I mean, we could try injecting it straight into the tumor and just looking to see if the dye is gonna light up at all. Because once you start going through the blood system, especially with dye, sometimes they get cleared, right? So you have to, you may have to really up the concentration for it to accumulate in the tumor. And it could also be a time course thing, right? You should be able to. If you crank up the detectors, like I, I showed you on the skin, on any system, if you crank up the detector hard enough, you normally can see something. If you weren't seeing anything, you may not have been in the right focal plane. So we, we can try it again. I'm around. Any other questions? So the resolution is dependent on the lens. I actually have slides if you want to see how resolution works. But when you're talking about resolution, we're talking about the ability to see, to see the two things that are really close together. On the MP, the resolution is around 250 to 300 nanometers, depending on the wavelengths we're talking about. So if your fibers are closer than that, you won't see them as distinct things. But if they're further apart than that, you should be able to see individual fibers. It actually doesn't matter how big the structure itself is rather it's spacing between it and its neighbor. So people who do SHG, you can often see the bundles and how the, the fibers are oriented in the structure. So the working distance of the lens is two millimeters. And what I mean by that is this focal spot right here is two millimeters from the front of the glass. So you can go up to two millimeters in before that hits the glass and you can't focus anymore. Now, when you're talking about an intracranial window, you have to worry about how much glass is there, 
how much space is between the glass and the brain, and that will limit how much you can, how far you can go. Uh, actually, Steve and Dan from the Brat Lab, who have been doing these experiments right here, how, how deep have you guys been able to go? A couple hundred microns? Yeah, because when we talk about excitation and mm -hmm. penetration, we're talking about the excitation side, right? If I was at, at 7.40 here and green fluorophores are coming out of it, it still has to make its way back through this tissue. So if your stuff's really, really, really bright, you can get away with deeper, potentially deeper planes. If it's really dim, you can't even get 100 microns in. This image of the brain, um, I can't recall, because it was done with Nikon, um, if there was a window there or not, but they were able to go a millimeter and a half in. The other complicating factor with the glass is uh, it messes with the light path. So you guys have all seen a pencil and a glass of water and that looks broken. And that's because there's a change in refractive index between air and water. You can imagine in a sample, this is really bad. Let me see if I can find the slide for this. So we're adding cover slips. So if you've got water, cover slip, ECM, Dura, who knows what else you've got in that area. Although I think you guys removed the Dura, right? When you're putting in these windows? No. So that has a different density than the brain itself. So the light is bouncing around inside the microscope and that lowers your resolution and your ability to image deep. So this is what winds up happening if you're not well matched light will bounce around in here and then it doesn't come out anywhere near the way it should be. So by putting glass and you've got Dura, you lose depth. But 750 is not, it's almost a millimeter in third ray. The eight millimeter working distance lens, I don't think you'll get that, that high of a resolution. So you can keep the water. Any other questions? Uh, is it possible to multiplex XHG with other fluorophores? Yes, a absolutely. That's what we do all the time. So um, the Leica system, the Nikon system is cube-based. So you've got blue X emission, green emission, and there's a pretty wide range of wavelengths that fall into that. The Leica system allows you to tune your detectors to whatever wavelengths you want. So on that system, you can do up to four fluorophores at the same time and you pick the wavelengths. But in either case, you can image SHG on, on either one of the systems and multiplex because it's just half the excitation wavelength. So it actually makes it easier. Okay. I hope you guys found that informative. Thank you for coming. Um, and have a great week.